Would you like an MBA program that provides a strong general management education on a beautiful campus with a close-knit community and an alumni network that's tighter than tight? Today's podcast is just for you. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 430th episode of the Mission Straight Talk, Accept This Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. One of the questions applicants sometimes ask is, are accepted services worth the money? The answer is a resounding yes, at least in my opinion. And if you're curious as to why that's so, or how can I say so with such confidence, check out the MBA Consultant ROI Calculator and find out for yourself how much not teaming up with an accepted consultant could cost you. Just go to accepted.com slash MBA Consultant ROI and obtain your free assessment. Use the calculator and you'll see three different scenarios that you can try out. It's all free. It gives me great pleasure to have on Admissions Straight Talk, Pat Harris and Amy Mitson, co-executive directors of the of MBA Admissions and Financial Aid at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Amy joined the Tuck Admissions Office in 2000. An attorney by education, Pat joined the Tuck MBA Admissions Office in 2004. So obviously they're highly experienced. Both have assumed increasing responsibilities over the years and became co-executive directors in September, 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. I believe I met both of them way back when Tuck hosted a conference for admissions consultants in 2005 and probably had them on our typing only chats uh, also way back when in the late 2000s. And now it's my pleasure to have you both on for the first time. Amy and Pat, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you, Linda. It's great to be here. Same. to have you. Great. Now let's start with some general questions about the Tuck MBA and then I'll get a little bit more specific. Um, Can you give an overview of the full-time program focusing on its more distinctive elements? And I'll let you decide which one should start. Sure. Uh, This is Amy and I'll jump in to to start us off. Um, So the the Tuck program starts with an expanded orientation for students to establish a firm foundation so they can jump into a very rigorous academic experience during their time at Tuck. It was several years ago when we redesigned the orientation program to now be called Tuck Launch. And there are several components of that integrated programming and Tuck Launch experiential learning, as well as very specific opportunities for reflection. So we believe this sets a stronger foundation as people jump into the core curriculum. The core curriculum at Tuck um, you know, begins uh, and weaves its way through the first year at Tuck with um, an expanded fall term opportunities, new data analytics courses. Um, we made some changes to the winter term to try to optimize student academics as well as recruiting. And we've gotten some very positive feedback on that. When students head into the spring term of the first year, a distinct element of the Tuck experience is the first year project. Many programs, uh, many MBA programs will have a capstone project in their first year. The uniqueness of Tuck is that students have total choice of the team that they want to work with uh, and the project that they want to work on. And so it could be something consulting, nonprofit focused, entrepreneurial, where you'd present to investors at the end of the project. Sometimes students are working with alumni, local projects, global projects, the sky is the limit. And so at that particular point in the curriculum, students definitely have the relationships built and have met all of their classmates and start to bring teams together. And it's a great opportunity um, to apply the skills that students learn throughout the first year core. Then heading into the second year curriculum, it is all elective based with incredible opportunities for experiential learning, working with faculty in very small scale electives, or of course, um, you know, some of our larger, more popular electives like investments and negotiations, um, definite, uh, some leadership and um, communications courses and, and the list goes on. 
The Tuck MBA is also a STEM designated MBA program. And so students have the opportunity to follow a selection of courses that gives them that STEM designation at the end of their two years. And so that's, that's something that we've done for the last few years as well. But the distinctive element is definitely the choice that students have to create the learning experience as they maneuver through the core curriculum and into the elective curriculum um, during their two years. Of course, the the internship in the middle of it, um, we can we can talk more about that later, but that's um, that's something where a, a distinct element of the Tuck experience is definitely the the one on one career coaching, whether students have an eye on exactly what they want to do or an exploration for their job search. Um, we have 100 percent placement for our students when it comes to the summer internship and a whole ecosystem of resources to help them get there, but definitely the, the connectedness there and the opportunities when it comes to recruiting and summer internships and, and full-time offers, all of that weaves its way together. And um, that's a, those are some of the things that I, that I feel in response to that question. Okay, great. Pat, do you have anything to add? I think the only thing I would add is um, I think what makes the Tuck program distinctive from many of our peers is that the scale, the focus, and the access, that the personal scale, it is one of the smaller programs of our peer institutions with you know, approximately 285 students per class, where you really have the opportunity to get to know your classmates very, very well, um, and also develop personal relationships with the faculty and the administration. Um, and then it's combined with being in a location like Canover, New Hampshire, where you're away from the distractions of a big city. Um, so it becomes this very immersive program. It is a 24 seven all in kind of program. And it's a, what this creates is it's, it's personal, it's connected and therefore transformative um, experience for the students. And they will go on and transform the world as a result. Wonderful, thank you. How have um, pandemic restrictions affected the MBA experience and program at Tuck? I mean, that's a major concern of applicants. And both good and bad. Yeah, I, I'd love to jump in and just say uh, pandemic restrictions absolutely have been in effect and there have been some limitations, but I'll, I'll start with the silver linings first. You know, the career services team in the last year when there were many restrictions had the opportunity to develop even more uh, corporate relationships than they had in the past. So students had even more opportunities than they did in a prior, what we'd maybe call a normal year. So the career services team definitely did a lot of development there, and it was easy to stand up a, a conversation with a recruiter over Zoom, and students reaped the benefit of that. Increased uh, access and connection with alumni. We have alumni who are always visiting campus, but in the year when people weren't able to travel, our dean, Matt Slaughter, really led the way in launching conversations, you know, a view from the top. And um, for prospective applicants listening out there, you can see some of those recordings on our website. But that was conversations with senior alumni um, across the world in different industries, just having a conversation with the dean about leading during the pandemic. And so these were opportunities for the entire community, not just students, but also alumni and faculty and staff to engage in these conversations. So bringing alumni to everyone. There was also increased conversation on the admission side. We reached candidates all over the world at all times of day. So increasing that access for candidates and for us was definitely a silver lining. And even when we go back to travel, we won't let go of that opportunity to connect with people virtually because it, it you know, kind of decreases any kind of barrier for investment of time or resources to connect with the admissions committee or with any students. So we really enjoyed meeting a lot of people. There were some pauses when it came to the global opportunities at Tuck, and we will be slowly rolling back into those global opportunities for students this year, carefully and thoughtfully, but we did have to put a pause on those in this, this past year. But the, the results on the career side were incredible. The opportunities that faculty, once they got really comfortable in the classroom with all the technology, and man, they ramped it up quickly, so I hand it to them, but having that case discussion and then bringing the CEO in or bringing the alumni into that classroom discussion for 10 or 15 minutes over Zoom, which they might not have done in the past, was definitely a benefit to the students. And 
I think um, also help keep the faculty inspired to bring really meaningful, relevant content and communication, even when things were limited because people couldn't travel to campus. Okay. Pat, do you have anything to add? Yeah, one, one aspect of COVID that I hear from a lot of applicants is this concern that so many people were deferred because of COVID and that there won't be space going into the next year's class. That was not the case at Tuck. Um, we accommodated all of our international students who were delayed with visas. We're doing it again this year, if there are any, that with visa delays, we came up with hybrid solutions. They were able to attend. So we did not have this mass deferral of a large number of students. So we have the same number of seats each, you know, going into the class of 24, the class of 23, neither was impacted by, by large scale deferrals. So I, I want to assure people that, that that is not going to be the case. That's a great point. Thank you. What don't people know about Tuck that you would like them to know, or perhaps a common misconception that you'd like to dispel? I'll tell you what, Pat, why don't you start this? Yeah, one? the common misconception. I, you know, I think people are worried that, you know, we are in a small town in New Hampshire, and I think people are worried that we're in this remote location, either there's nothing to do or recruiters aren't gonna come or you know what, whatever impact it is. And it's absolutely not the case. I think our location is, is what makes Tuck so special. It's um, gorgeous. I, I touched it's on- absolutely yeah, gorgeous. It, it is a beautiful you. place to be. That, that opportunity to you know, I hear about research into your ability to learn when you're you know, more in a peaceful, natural setting. And you definitely have that at Tuck, but I think that the focus that it brings, I, I touched on before, it's a very immersive environment and it creates an access. So, you know, hitting on the recruiting question, um, recruiters absolutely come to Tuck. They want our students, our placement stats are a, a great demonstration of the marketability of our students. Um, when those recruiters come, they're a captive audience. Um, they, you know, they, they are, they too are away from the distractions of big cities. So the entire focus of their visit is on recruiting Tuck students and connecting with them. The size of the student body, you know, in perspective, the number of people you are competing with for FaceTime with recruiters or connections with them is, is reduced. Um, and, and they come up and they've put in more effort to get to Hanover. So they tend to stay longer. And so they are, you know, recruiters as well as visiting executives, CEOs that are coming to campus, they've made this investment to come. So they really spend time with our students. You know, they are meeting them for drinks at Murphy's. They're taking small groups of students out to lunch or dinner. They're holding open office hours. So our students have the opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one with recruiters or connect one-on-one -on -one with CEOs from leading companies and really getting personal access um, and able to really learn from them in a one-on-one -on -one or a very small group setting. And I think that's a, a unique aspect and, and such a value of being in an environment like, like Hanover. Um, and our students are never lacking for anything to do. They make their own fun. You know, they're not going out clubbing till 2 a.m. in the morning, but who wants to do that? You know, they are, they are creating memories. They're, you know, they're hiking together, they're canoeing, they're skiing, they're hosting parties, they're cooking dinner for each other. Um, and then there's there's a lot going on. Yes, we're a small town in New Hampshire. We're also an Ivy League college in New Hampshire. So there are arts opportunities, a, a world-class museum. So there's a lot going on. And um, because it's a small town, you really have that opportunity to take advantage of everything that Tuck has to offer and that the Upper Valley has to offer. And just to echo something that Pat said, I led a virtual information session last night where five alumni joined me on a panel. And before all the prospective students came into the session, the very first question that the two different alums asked when joining the session um, or will recruiting be in person because I want to come back to campus and recruit <laughs> for my company. So they were very enthusiastic about that. I, I echo everything Pat said. Um, and, and we'll also say, you know, a, a common misconception, you know, are students graduating from Tuck just getting jobs in the Northeast? You know, is it just is very regional in that in that regard and no, um, you know, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, and globally, student placement is incredibly strong and um, very diverse. I think, again, the, the 
the strong connection with alumni, they are all over the world and they're very interested in the next group of Tuckies and want to hire them or talk to them about their company or share their experiences. And that helps with um, student recruiting and, and you know, helps with placement and wherever students want to go. In addition to the full-time career services team that we have in Hanover, we also have a dedicated career services person on the West Coast. And that's been pivotal for students, especially with tech recruiting. So just wanted to add that to Pat's comments as well. Right. Great points. All of them. Thank you so much. Now let's, let's turn to the application. Tuck lays out pretty clearly its four criteria for acceptance smart, accomplished, aware, and encouraging. Can you unpack those criteria a little bit, make them a little bit more down to earth perhaps? Absolutely, I would love to. And, and we came up with the criteria because what we did was we looked at who were successful Tuck students, who were successful Tuck alums, and they demonstrated those four qualities. And so that's what we came at as we were creating the, or re revising our criteria. Smart, you know, pretty straightforward. We are looking for people who were successful in their undergraduate or graduate programs. We're looking at test scores. We're looking at undergraduate GPA performance. Um, that one's kind of obvious, but it's, you know, that's kind of the, the academic smart aptitude. We're also looking for smart in their attitude. Um, we want people who are curious and engaged. Tuck students have confident humility about what they know and what they don't know. And so we're, we're looking for those qualities on top of, of the just academic performance and the test score performance. Um, in terms of accomplished, that one also is pretty straightforward. We're looking for impact and advancement in your careers. We're also looking for accomplishment in extracurricular activities, community involvement, personal accomplishments, you know, all of that comes into the accomplishment factor, kind of what's on your resume. In terms of awareness, it's kind of two directions. So we're looking for awareness applicants who have taken time to reflect and really think out who they are, where have they come from, how have their experiences shaped who they are, shaped their character, but also in terms and, and how that will contribute to the Tuck community. And then also in terms of awareness, it's more forward thinking of what are the applicant's goals? What have they set forth that they want to do in this world? How will an MBA help them achieve those goals? And how will an MBA from Tuck specifically help them achieve those goals? So that's what we're looking for in terms of awareness. And then in terms of encouraging, I think this is truly quintessential Tuck. This is the Tuck community at its finest. You know, our students are encouraging, collaborative, and empathetic. They are great team players. This doesn't mean that they're pushovers. Um, they are willing to, you know, to, to stand up, you know, to push back. But when they do so, they do it respectfully. They do it in a constructive way um, and in a positive method. And then I think that the key thing here is Tuck students recognize, you know, my success and your success are not mutually exclusive. And so they work to build each other out. It is not a place where you're only looking out for number one. Um, and so the, that describes our Tuck students, that describes our alums, and that's what we're looking for in our applicants. Great answer. Thank you. Can you be accomplished without being smart and aware? You know, that's interesting. I think, yes, it, of course, there's going to be overlap yeah. with, all, you know, with all four of these criteria. You know, if you're going to be a successful person, you're good with people, you're smart, you're, you're thoughtful. When we come back to it as admissions criteria, Right. Um, I think it's important to remember it is a holistic evaluation process. And so strengths in one criterion or criteria can balance out weaknesses in other areas. So someone could be very accomplished in their career and bring amazing impact to the table, but their, you know, those, those factors, you know, the GPA and the GMAT maybe are not quite as competitive as others in the applicant pool. And those things balance each other out. So you know, of course there's gonna be overlap, but we don't have to see all four. There's gonna be varying, people are gonna shine for different reasons on different criteria. I think that's a great, great point also that uh, you don't have to be equally strong in all four. Mm -hmm. Amy, you look like you have something to add. I just, I, I agree and different applications are running through my mind and people shine for, for different reasons. And, you know, we know the, the things that may not be as strong, they can fine tune at Tuck, but they, they have everything that they need to, to jump into the program and to be successful and to grow. 
it also seems like your your four criteria they're they're not what you're going to teach right you're not going to teach somebody to be smart you know you could perhaps teach them to be accomplished a little bit but you're not going to teach them necessarily to be aware to, to start with you know and you're probably not going to start somebody who's a discouraging person and transform them into an, an encouraging person you might build on those qualities that so anyway that's you know th that. and on that like i think the application process um you know and people coming into the mba program they have a lot of aspirations and desires for growth and right. so they present to us in the application where they are and then because these things are woven into the community in ways, I, I think people can grow along that journey, even though it's not a, here's the 101 on how to be aware. No, right. it's by exactly. being in that community that you then can strengthen that um, capacity. Right. I remember asking once a principal at my kid's school, I said, how does the school do in terms of character development? He said, character development, kids learn at home. They're not going to learn it in school. And uh, I think he was right. The school mm -hmm. can reinforce what the child, and obviously you're dealing with adults, but I was dealing with teenagers, uh, learn at home. But anyways, let's get back to the uh, mm -hmm. tuck and the application. Um, tuck requires a GRE or a GMAT, correct? Yes, um, correct. Do you, do you have any plans to accept executive assessment or other exams or any thought to consider waiver requests or go test optional? Yeah, at, at this moment in time, we're not considering going test optional. We do still require a GMAT or a GRE um, for, for applicants out there to know that while this is an important data point that we, we still consider and we will still ask for the tests, it's just one amongst that holistic review that Pat mentioned. So we do still require the test and it's one piece of, um, of the bigger puzzle that you present to us with your candidacy. Okay, great. Now, I know that Tuck takes an applicant's highest score when evaluating the application. And I vaguely recall that there was a time, I could be wrong on this, that you actually took the highest verbal and the highest quant. Do you still do that or do I, did I make a mistake? We, we love to see all of the test scores, but we're not creating a new kind of super score for the individual applicant. We definitely consider the progress people have made on the tests and the highest scores um, in the overall evaluation. Okay, great. Now, Tuck has three required 300 word essays and one optional and then an additional required essay for reapplicants. What do you hope to learn from the essays, especially this, this year's new essay that you don't get from the transcript resume and application boxes? I'm sure there's a lot there, but. Sure, sure. Um, so each part of the application maps to a different criterion. Okay. So, you know, smart, you're, we're getting smart from your GMAT, your, your test scores and your, your transcripts. We're getting accomplished from your resume and your answers to the, the work history and extracurriculars. The, the aware and encouraging criteria are harder to quantify from those kinds of documents. So mm -hmm. the essays specifically track to aware and encouraging. So essay one, where we're, we're asking about why an MBA and why Tuck, that gets to that forward thinking part of awareness that I talked about before. Um, essay two of tell us who you are, that's getting to the reflective part of awareness that I, I was discussing. And then essay three is getting toward at, at that encouraging part. Mm -hmm. um, we we uh, changed the question slightly this year and, and made it broader because we wanted to give people more opportunity to share how they might satisfy the encouraging criteria. And so the, this opens up the opportunity, students may, or applicants may choose to, to provide a similar example, how they, you know, how they helped someone achieve success like last year's question was, but this also gives them the option instead to talk about you know, a time where maybe they had to pushback or a time that they dealt with empathetically with people who were different than they were. So we wanted to broaden um, the opportunities to share encouraging with us. So that, that's what we're hoping to get out of those essays. And I'll, I'll put in a pitch for our blog. Um, we get, we've got a, a, the Tuck 360 blog on our website goes into detail about what are we looking for in each of our essay questions? What do we mean by smart, accomplished, aware, and encouraging? And what to expect for the interview? What are we looking for in the letters of reference? So I, I 
encourage applicants to talk to take a look at that because it is a good resource. Okay, we'll link to it also from the show notes at accept.com slash 430. What is the most common mistake or mistakes that you see applicants make in the application process? Uh, I, I guess I'll start and, and say, you know, as we are reading applications, we're really reading with an eye on the positive and not looking for mistakes. We're looking for reasons to admit candidates. We're looking for strengths. I come into reading an application believing and ready to be enthusiastic about someone's candidacy. And so I'm not, I'm not looking for those mistakes. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm just really enthusiastic and reading in a, in a positive manner. And our, our committee moves forward in that, in that way. Sometimes we see candidates, you know, who maybe miss an opportunity, right? So missing an opportunity to share with us um, less so what they've done, but the reasons behind why they have taken a certain course of action. Uh, why was there this particular transition in their background? When people are answering the essay questions, you know, the detail of what you have done, I often will see in your resume, but, you know, sometimes don't miss the opportunity to connect with the excitement of the committee by sharing a little bit about your motivation behind the things that you've done and the impact that you've had, not just the what. So, the why. so yeah, yeah. I wonder if that also goes along with being aware. (laughs) (laughs) Agree. Right. Pat, do you have anything to add to that one? Um, I think making sure that you never leave us guessing about anything. And this, this goes a little bit with, with Amy's point of, you know, if you have a job gap, be sure to explain it. Or if you have a a unusual choice of recommender or, you know, your grades took a dip, don't, don't ignore it. You know, we see it. So ignoring it doesn't, doesn't make it go away. Be straightforward. Tell us what happened, but don't make us guess because we get too creative in what we guess <laughs> and we often get it wrong. So I think fill in those blanks for us. Um, you know, help us understand how you've gotten from point A to point B. The mind reading isn't among your qualifications. <laughs> okay. Not yet. Not yet, huh? Okay. What will interviews be like this year at Tech, the upcoming cycle? Sure. So we will continue this past year. Um, all of our interviews were virtual, and we will continue to have virtual interviews going forward. We will also continue to offer interviews by invitation. So after you've applied, we'll review your application and invite you to interview. In the past, one of the things that we loved about Tuck was the opportunity to have an open interview policy for candidates who came to campus. In light of COVID, that hasn't been possible. So we've had to move to the invitational interview, but to somewhat replicate that open interview policy, what we have is an opportunity for a guaranteed interview. So if applicants for round one submit their application by the early deadline of, of September 1, they can guarantee themselves an interview. So if they get it in complete application with, you know, app fee paid and letters of reference done and your GMAT scores or GRE scores in, then you're guaranteed an interview for round two, as long as it's in by December 1st, same thing. You can guarantee yourself an interview that way. So that's been our, our compromise since we're not able to bring people to campus for open interviews. Do you anticipate, let's, let's hope that the restrictions end up in our rear view mirror and that we can have visits, you know, visit, I could visit uh, Tuck. Um, other people can visit Tuck in the future. Would you like to have in, in-person interviews again, or do you see yourself kind of doing it both ways? I'd love to be able to have them in person again. Yes. Um, but it, you know, kind of back to Amy's silver lining, it, it has opened up lots of opportunities. And in the past, if we had candidates who couldn't come to campus, we interviewed them virtually. So it's not totally new for us. What was totally new for us this year was that 100% of our students coming in in two weeks were interviewed virtually. Right. And have presumably never been to campus unless they visited, you know, before COVID. Yeah. A lot. Right. Right. What candidates do you not see enough of in the applicant pool? Would you like to see more of in the applicant pool? a hard one you know I as soon we as you say about this <laughs> yeah as soon as you say like I want to see more of this candidate everybody else who doesn't fit that profile says well <laughs> you don't want me um so 
what do I want more of? I want I want more candidates who are excited about the MBA, who know where they're going in, in life, are excited about an MBA, are excited about Tuck and know, you know, recognize the, the opportunities that our, our unique program has to offer and are ready to jump in with both feet and contribute to the program and, and make Tuck an even better place. Great answer. Amy, anything to add to that one? I, I just agree. And I think um, applicants can come from so many different types of background and just be a great fit for the program. Um, and so I, I support that, Pat, for sure. Okay. Now, some applicants have specific elements of their background that you know, they're, they're really worried, give them grave concern. And I'm not even talking about, oh, I went to a no-name undergrad or something like that, or I don't have a blue chip firm on my resume. Those are also items of concern. But I think those can be dealt with more easily. How mm -hmm. do you view applicants who had a dip in grade to perhaps a period of unemployment due to a mental health issue, you know, depression, uh, anxiety, whatever? Mm -hmm. I, you know, on that, we, we encourage you in the application process to give us a chance to get to know you and understand the full picture of your candidacy. So if there was a major life event like that, it's certainly going to impact other things. And if it's not explained, then we, we see that there's a disconnect somewhere and something feels like it's missing when we read the application. So the, the best bet there, if the, if the candidate can kind of bring their confidence and know that we are reading openly and with, with positivity, and we just, you know, as a candidate, tell us what happened, tell us what you learned from that. And, and nothing is going to disqualify you from, from being fully considered to the program. We have heard a lot of stories over the years and, and much more serious than, oh, I you know failed chemistry freshman year. Um, and we, we understand this is a whole life you have lived in some capacities prior to applying for the MBA. You've had a lot of experiences. So please um, be open and know that we, we are receiving it and we just respect your candidacy and your ability to share something difficult with us. So just, just tell us, tell us what's happening and, and share it in whatever way you're, you're most comfortable with. We accept in advance. So in other words, that would not automatically disqualify them. Not at all. Not at no, all. And, and like mental health issues. I think people are much more open about sharing yeah. that. And I feel like in the 17 some years that I've been doing that, I, I hear about it much more in, in applicant in applications. I think they're more comfortable sharing it. And, and that's great. Help us understand the full picture of you. Okay. And what about, this is, this is on some level similar and obviously very different. What about somebody who wants to apply and maybe they have an academic infraction or a misdemeanor or some actual, actually criminal uh, blot on their record? How is that? Go ahead, Amy. I, I just think, you know, I've, I'm, we're familiar. We have, have seen some of that before. Um, so it, it probably won't be the first time um, that there is a blemish there. And so um, we've been able to put it into context in the past and admit a candidate with something like that in their past. And there is a clear demonstration with behavior after that point in your personal history, where we see that you have rebuilt, that you have taken the steps to, um, you know, just be open and move forward from that particular time with more maturity and awareness. And, you know, talking about that journey can be incredibly compelling in an application. Right. Yes. People make mistakes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Depends what happens afterwards. So mm -hmm. good. I think it was Jonathan Sachs who said that um, a failure is a mistake that you don't learn from. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, what advice do you have for applicants wanting to join the class of 2024? In other words, they're applying this cycle, they're gearing up, it's immediate, it's now or very soon. What, what would you tell that applicant? Get to know us. Um, you know, explore Tuck. So talk to Tuckies. Tuckies love to talk about Tuck. So reach out to our students. We've got on our website a, 
student ambassador page where you can find somebody with a similar background to you or similar career goals to you or involvement in clubs, reach out to them and talk to them and, and find out about Tuck. Attend our, you know, we're not traveling this fall, but we have all kinds of online events, small coffee chats with admissions officers and students to larger Tuck presentations with alumni panels, um, lots of opportunities to learn about the program. So do take that that up, take, take advantage of that and really learn about Tuck and make sure, you know, Tuck is the right place for you um, and, and really help us, help yourself and help us see how Tuck matches with the goals that you've set for yourself. Absolutely. And I will, will add to that, um, you know, taking a look at the different backgrounds of students that have come through the program, we have something called Tuck Pathways and you can see the student journey of where they started, what their key learnings were at Tuck, and then where they went when they graduated. And sometimes for an applicant to see that someone made this transition or that someone did this, it can help you, it can help that applicant get to know the opportunities at Tuck um, alongside understanding the criteria and the application process. But as Pat said, exploring those different opportunities for engagement to help you understand your connection to the program because you know thinking about a question that you asked earlier Linda um, when people are you know talking about their candidacy and their connection with Tuck it's not about how much you love Tuck as a candidate right it's it's also about like how much you know about Tuck and the connection that you have to then be able to you know, grow in, in the environment, that it's a place where you can thrive. You know, all of the top MBA programs are going to offer you the absolute best of every opportunity, but how is Tuck special in that way of all of these choices that you might have? And it's, it's great that, you know, you love the outdoors or you love a certain aspect of the program, but knowing it and, and demonstrating how you do know the program and your connection with it is important. And talking to people in the program, talking to the alumni and the things that Pat highlighted is, is a critical piece. And um, just don't, don't miss that opportunity to do that. There's even if you're, even if you're just opening the application now and the deadline is eight weeks away, or you're just opening it in September or October, and you're thinking about round two, you have time to talk to somebody about Tuck. And as you can tell yeah. for me, it's easier to get somebody to start talking about Tuck than it is to have them stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so be prepared for that. Any you can reach out to alumni on LinkedIn or ambassadors on our website, and you will receive a positive response. And that conversation will help you get to start to know Tuck and get a feel for it, even if you have yet to visit. Right. Oh, I I can I think that's so important. I used to be I used to recommend applicants, you know, visit. Obviously, right now that's not possible for most people, in most cases. Um, but talking to people, getting a sense of the culture is, is just so important in, in, in an applicant's ability to show fit. It's just, uh, it's just absolutely critical. And also to know how the program is going to, the TUG program is going to help them achieve their goals and meet their needs and expectations for an MBA program. So that's great advice. What advice would you give to someone thinking ahead for, let's say, a fall 2022 or later application. Maybe they are just a year or two out of college and they're thinking ahead and you know, they're, they're thinking, you know, I, I'm doing whatever I'm doing now. It might be more, something more technical, but I want the general management education and I, I love a small close-knit community and a beautiful location. For the person thinking ahead, what advice do you have for them? I'll jump in with one quick thing because I occasionally will receive inquiries from from folks who have just graduated from college or, you know, you, you pick up the phone and, and it's someone who's, you know, getting ready to graduate and then they're thinking about applying um, in the fall. I say, okay, well, have you, have you thought about this? You know, wait a minute. And I will often recommend um, for people who are thinking ahead to take a look at the first essay, right? You can see the essay questions for this year and take a look at that first essay and try to answer the why MBA. You know, and so just just take a minute with the essays and start thinking about that. And you can, you know, start that answer and it will evolve as you get closer to your application process in a year. Also, as you're going through maybe that first job out of college or those very early positions, 
keep a record of your accomplishment. Keep a record Great of idea. the times when you made a mistake or somebody really gave you a pat on the back. You'll forget all those great things that happened and you'll forget some of the mistakes too, but try to keep track of, even if you just jot it in your phone, like your notes for your future application, keep track of the things that you're doing in that year or two before you apply. Cause those will be great experiences to draw from in an essay or in an interview conversation, potentially. Fantastic suggestion. Mm-hmm. Pat, what do you want to add to that? To develop relationships with supervisors and mentors. These are going to be your future recommenders. And so working with them so they, they know you well um, is a, you know, not, not doing it in an opportunistic way, but, you know, one, you're learning from them and you're going to grow because you're working closely with them. But then those are going to be the people that can write thoughtfully about you going forward. And you want people who know you really well. Um, take stretch assignments, really push yourself in those couple years to have an impact, you know, try something, try, you know, try something where you're going to have an impact with your employer, Um, stay involved in the community um, and be be thoughtful, like really take the time. And this is whether you're applying now or whether you're applying in a couple years, take the time to reflect, figure out what it is that you want to do. So like do informational interviews with people from the kinds of careers that you're thinking about um, and see like, how did they get there? Maybe they didn't get there with an MBA. Maybe they did, but try and, you know, explore the, the various pathways for yourself. So when it is time to, to apply, you've thought through all of this, you've got a, a good understanding of what you want to do, what you want out of an MBA and where you want to go. Again, great suggestions. Thank you very much. What would each of you have liked me to ask? And Pat, why don't you start this one? Oh, you, you hit on so many really good questions. <laughs> um, oh, Amy, do you have anything? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I did a good job. I, I think so. Linda, you're well, well practiced at this. Let me think, I can think of another question for you, but I think, I think you've also been wonderful guests and really, I think we covered a lot of ground here. Well, thank you. And if, if an applicant had answered that way in an interview, I wouldn't have been pleased. So that wasn't very good. (laughs) My my response to pun. So this is a a case of don't do as I do. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Listeners, I hope you'll, you'll forgive them. I guess I did a good job, but, um, Uh, Thank you very much, Pat and Amy. Thank you very much for joining me today. Where can listeners and potential applicants learn more about Dartmouth Tech's MBA program? Um, For people wanting to explore more about the MBA program, you can go to tuck.dartmouth.edu. You can also do a backslash there for admissions online events. And please join us, whether you're applying this year or in a future year, you're welcome to join um, the robust uh, opportunities that we have for um, virtual events, whether it's conversations with admissions or with some of our current students. We had also mentioned the Tuck360 blog, just Tuck360. That's a great space to hear directly from the admissions committee, as well as students who will be talking about their summer internship experiences and as they start orientation in just two weeks at Tuck. Great. Thank you very much. We'll include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 430 to the sites that uh, Amy just mentioned, as well as to related articles and interviews. They're all linked to from accept.com slash 430. Quick reminder, don't miss the MBA consultant ROI calculator and at least consider what could be a fantastic investment in your future. You can find it at accepted.com slash MBA consultant ROI. Listener, thank you too for joining Pat Harris and Amy Mitson and me for our 430th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, please subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any future shows, be they with admissions directors, professors, current students, test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.